soft sofa, still warm from an excess of tea, and cakes? There might have been little cakes. Prodigious snoring rumbles in from the floor above you, and you quietly take your leave. Square with the poise of Betty Davis, the confident stride, and inimitable mannerisms elevating the sidewalk into a plush Hollywood carpet, and wrapped around her neck, a yellow velvet ribbon, bright as an ocean sunrise. You question a well-dressed man parked outside an oyster house. Prudish woman. I took her on a fine date, and she didn't remove so much as a ribbon. Excuse me, can you step back from the coop? That's the spirit. You decide to seek a second opinion. You talk with a waitress smoking outside a diner. Something funny about her. Just showed up one day. Doesn't work, doesn't live anywhere as far as I know. Just around. Myself. I'd love to know who made all her beautiful clothes. You ask the woman if you may join her at a public bench. You may. Lovely outside, isn't it? Her eyes are a beautiful shade of brown. Beneath the yellow ribbon, a thick, fibrous scar wraps around her throat. Was I like this? It reminds me of Paris. They don't come every year, you know. The old man is sitting at the edge of a rotting old pier, crooked legs dangling over the water. He watches a pair of seagulls preen and groom each other on a rock just off the shore. Just when the fishing is going to be good. He taps great, black, thick globs of spent tobacco out of a huge ceramic pipe. I got another year, I guess. Another year of this town being here, he replies, letting a grin spread across his face. If the seagulls came, that means enough fish to keep it in place. horseback pull up next to one another in front of the grocer. Suddenly, the driver and the rider, two wiry old men with identical haircuts, start shrieking at one another. The man with the truck leaps into the street. Bro! 
brother! He shouts. The one on the horse tumbles out of his saddle. <laughs> brother! He screams. They embrace in the road. Thirty years! Hollers the driver. The rider, tears streaming down over his face, corrects him. <laughs> no! Thirty-two! Everyone here is watching these two older men cry and hug one another in the middle of Main Street. Cars and wagons are backing up. People are yelling. Take a photo of us! The driver begs you. Starts hauling a tripod out of the bed of his truck. As you usher them onto the sidewalk, the driver says, Joe, I thought you were dead. The rider freezes. Joe? He blurts. I'm not Joe. The two men stare at one another, each slowly recognizing something alien in their mistaken brother's face. This city is like no other you've been to. Crooked streets splay out in a maze of narrow passages, no two alike. Soon, you find yourself in twilight, utterly lost. Bright light crests around one corner, a car approaching. Unable to afford rescue, you keep walking. The asphalt turns to crooked cobblestones that threaten to wrench your ankle out of place. Was this always a moonless night? The stars multiply, each one looking like a pinprick through which light is exiting the terrestrial world. It's hard finding your way through in pitch darkness. You go by touch and sound feeling the scale of the streets by the echoing of your footsteps, fingers tracing the rough surface of the buildings, and then a rumble of noise in the distance. You quiet yourself, suddenly fearful. The clear sky tells you it's not thunder, but cannon fire. The city comes alive with fires and shouting, you find yourself trampled by a mob of men in thick brown coats, a phalanx of bayonets advancing up the street. When you come to, there's no sign of the commotion, the war that you were just caught in. The comically shrill honk of a Model A running up the road startles you, and you crawl toward the sidewalk. Above, the sky is a sharp, cold, cloudless blue.
As you walk along the river near an unfinished bridge, a man with a tool belt catches sight of you. Hey, over there, he calls out. You look like you could use a quick way to get some hard-earned money. Hard-earned is right. The bridge hangs high over a perilous drop. Great! He exclaims. Suppose you'll want a safety belt. We Thunderbird people don't need them. We fly when we fall. You find yourself up high, looking over the rushing river that crashes around the foundation of the bridge. As you work side by side, the man mentions, You can see Thunderbirds up here if you know how to look. You ask him to explain. Practice your peripheral vision, if you dare. Last thing you need up here is for them to see you seeing them and come swooping at you, he says laughingly. You only see the clouds thicken. It sure does pass the time working. The man pays you well when you're done with the job. Hey there, stranger. You're welcome to enjoy this fire with me, if you're respectful, that is. This here is my spot, and I ain't inclined to share it with any bad characters. You can call me Quinn. These here are my venturing companions. Kaz is the big un, and the one with the spots is Flip. beat my way on the rails, but the road news said this town was fat and the weather was fine. So I'm taking in the sights and seeing what I can drum up. I want to hear one of them venturing tales. Got any? A story, stranger. Authority, bosses and such. I ain't nobody's little Angelina, if that's what you're asking. I take care of myself and my dogs. I don't need no jocker looking out for me. So if you're offering, don't. Shoot, I thought I told you to be respectful. You want to keep enjoying my spot or not? Think about that. Hey, do you got any really thrilling stories to tell? I'm hankering for one of those. Leaving already? Well, me too. I think I'll go check out what's happening up the road this way. Maybe I'll see you around.
Tramping life suits me just fine. Every day is adventure. With things being so depressed, folks walk around like it's the end of everything good. Plenty of nice things to see if you know where to look. Shouts not far away break the spell. The deer's ears prick up. This thing is being hunted. You know a way out of here. As the hunter's cries get louder, you approach the deer carefully, palms outstretched. As you grow close, your features become clearer in the light of the deer's aura. It bolts into the path of an oncoming train. The engines belch black smoke as the ferry churns gray water into froth. A broad-shouldered figure leans out over the rail, eyeing the skyscrapers on the horizon. Nearby, a man and a woman speak in low, urgent voices. He takes her wrist gently. She is weeping softly. I wish you didn't have to go, she says. It's got to be work on some of those buildings going up. His thumb skates over her pulse point. I checked every day for a week. There ain't. I'll be back, though. Got your picture in my wallet, don't I? It's not forever. Her words 
are split by a sob. Might as well be. My parents didn't come to New York for this. She leans against him, the wind tossing her hair. He pulls her to his chest. I'm leaving because I gotta go. If there was another way... They stand together, close, quiet, in the stiff breeze. come across a girl picking wild blueberries. She smiles and greets you. Anin. She offers you some from her birch bark basket. You reach in the basket for blueberries, but pull out a handful of small, smooth stones, all the colors of the rainbow. The snickering girl runs into the trees as fast and light as a rabbit. When the stones reach the top of their arc above your head, they turn into butterflies, all the colors of the rainbow. Your heart leaps in surprise. reflective shade of blue, unusual in this region where bog iron colors the river's brown. Across the way, a goat with great leather wings laps up the water, its sunken red eyes fixed on your every movement. You now notice the unnatural absence of wildlife. No fish swim in the stream. No birds sing in the trees. The winged goat drinks with a forked tongue, only abstractly concerned with your presence. Over the hill, a scorched one-room house lies abandoned, two of its four walls in ruins. The goat rears up, front hooves curled, and stretches its wings out to their full breath. The goat opens its mouth and wails, a protracted, shrill sound, indistinguishable from the cry of a human infant. It only begins to stop 
when you take several steps back. The winged goat doesn't follow. Instead, it lies down inside the burnt house, surrounded by portraits of a large family, glass frames stained brown from smoke. Lightning is so strong that it seems to open a path in the haze above you. You are sure you see massive talons curved around the clouds. The thunder is so immense that the ground trembles. Your lips and hands tingle from the electric charge that fills the air until the dancing lightning passes on over the hill. night. This beach is long, stretching toward a receding sea. In the darkness, the sand seems coarse and gray, alien. The stars are dim and distant. It outshines the stars with its presence, a streak of sickly colored light, leaving a trail of distorted fire. It slowly creeps along the sky like a vast worm, though you know that, given the distance, it must be moving at great speed. And there, near the water's edge, a human figure. They stand there, transfixed by the light. One, two, three steps, ankles lowering into the surf, silent collapse into a black wave, bathed in a nameless color. Then, nothing. My twin brother Paul and I always got into trouble, but we were good. We didn't do nothing to anybody until we left. Then we hurt a lot of people. Me, more so than Paul, because he, well, he didn't make it through. The march I was on, the bonus army, it's less a bonus and more an acknowledgement of what I've had to suffer. Civilians will never understand. So anyway, tell me a funny story? You seem like you know a few good ones. I wish I could tell that one to my sister. The past doesn't even feel like it happened. It 
feels like it's happening in every moment, in every slumber. When the memories come back to you, do they clutch at you, at your heart? Know any good jokes? I'm not so good at Leaving? All right, I'm headed out this way next. Will our paths cross? If you see any others like me, treat them well. Invite them to share your fire, too. Even if they look well and whole. None of us are whole, really. None of us have got what we're owed. Man's uniform is dated and worn. He sits on the edge of the road, head in hands. He looks up as you approach. Can you help? Car clip me. I think my legs. Well, I'd appreciate it if you could deliver this for me. He holds out a brown envelope. The letter is addressed to a James Gibson Sr. 120 J Street, but the city stymies you. The blocks run straight from I to K. He stop a man for directions, but he shakes his head and laughs. <laughs> Someone's playing a joke on you. There's no J Street. Over here. A woman in a brown coat overheard your question. She steers you down an alley. Someone's chalked a big orange J on one wall. I thought Clovis was late. Go left up ahead. Old man Gibson's the third on the right. As you round the corner, the world changes. J Street is a place out of time. Like the city forgot an entire street a century ago and carried on around it, oblivious. Even the noise and bustle of D.C. can't penetrate this little pocket. The man who answers is ancient and stooped. He peers at the letter. I think it's from my son. I don't see so well anymore. Will you read it to me? You tear the letter open. It isn't good news. You read the letter, omitting a few key details, but his face still falls. I don't think he's coming home, he says. It's been so long, I don't think he's ever coming back. He takes the letter. Thank you for bringing word, at least.
scroll my name on the bare bones of the earth. I'm gonna dig my heels into the ground. Cause when that fairy man comes for to tally up my worth, I won't leave much to find that can be found. Faded shotgun houses sit in rows under the tall shadows of smokestacks. A worker in full uniform hollers from a porch. Hey, traveler! Throw me inside! Got some literature here! As you shut the door, the man glances out the window and draws the shades. Landlord toss you out? Ha! <laughs> Don't mind me, uh, it's none of my business. He pries up a floorboard with a crowbar. You glance over the man's shoulder to see inside the compartment canned goods, a pile of leaflets, the wood stock of a rifle. He replaces the board and stands. He hands you a can of whole potatoes, then a leaflet which reads, no evictions, no fascists, no hunger. Headed back to the shop, but we'll have a Bible meet soon. Bible meet. If you don't know James 5.1 by heart, learn it. That's our favorite scripture. Blistering sun has scared even birds into the shade, but a middle-aged woman and a young couple are still collecting scraps of cotton that the machinery missed. With a ragged voice, the older woman calls to you. You got any water? The three of them rush over to you, suddenly reanimated. They pass around your canteen. When you get it back, it's empty. The woman squeezes your hand and sighs with relief. Sweetest thing I ever tasted, she tells you. Electric lamps stipple the cotton field before you with an orange light, moving like a group of lethargic fireflies. From the field, the voices of the workers reach you in a soulful, united song. You're gently lulled to sleep as the song floats over you. Hello, Lordy, pick a bale of cotton. Hello, Lordy. Pick a bale a day. You're pulled out of your slumber by a woman's pained scream and a collection of shouts rising from the field. The woman's screams taper off, soon replaced by the raw cries of an infant. Applause briefly fills the night, eventually fading back into song. Oh, Lordy! You wake up to the gentle crescendo of the worker's song, unsure if it ever ceased at all.
gonna heal And the string of guitar strings is about the only thing I feel And if it was sex, jam test I don't know which way I would choose oh. Yeah, the thing about down, down is I need this soul sucker blue you emerge from the underbrush and find yourself at the edge of a field. A farmhouse sits at the other end. Close by, large family is tending to the plants together. They pause and regard you, almost nervously. Hello there? The grandmother asks. The family is almost too nice to you. When you ask for water, they don't even let you walk to the pump by the house. A child runs back to the shed for a folding chair, and they serve you lemonade in a glass among the lettuce heads. Halfway through your glass, you notice someone moving furtively down by the house. The cuffs of his white shirt are stained red. The father sees your look and shifts to block your view. His eyes are bright and his teeth are bared in something like worry. How do you like your lemonade? His wife arrives with a bag full of sandwiches for you and the whole family ushers you back into the woods, waving, wishing you well. You take one look back over your shoulder the man by the wall is gone. But his power I will deny Won't be temptation Just walk on by Oh yeah Someone had replaced them all with dusty glass bottles. 
you cool down in the shade. Goes through the bottles, making a series of heavy, hollow sounds. You think about wind chimes and the smell of fresh pies on windowsills. The dense sound of many conversations cuts your nap short. There's no one around, not until you look up at the bottles. They're filled with bright blue orbs. seem to notice your presence. And when I'm cold and empty, Can't get enough. Porcelain, chrome, the rusty ones. Gotta turn those sleek faucets. Ever find me in a hardware store, I'm gonna haunt it till the cows come home. Laughter rumbles inside neighboring bottles. Cause when my coals burn, I'm gonna cast my a sign in town says a farmer is hiring for the sugar cane harvest. A bag-eyed man drives you and ten hungry strangers out into the cane, where he leaves you. Everyone gets a hatchet, but no instruction. The foreman is missing for some reason. Nobody is sure what to do. A young man in a red jacket stuffs all the hatchets in his pack. This is stupid, he says. I'm leaving. You can get five bucks for a nice axe like this. He marches off into the cane and others follow. Don't, a young woman shouts after them. It's not right. The thief left some hatchets behind. So you and the three chumps left start chopping cane. It's brutal work. None of you know what you're doing. Keep going, the girl calls. Her hands are bleeding, and her face is bright with sweat. Soon, her cane is piled high. Sometime after noon, the truck rolls up with a boozy foreman riding shotgun. Good work, he croaks. The girl wipes her blood-pinked hands on her apron to take her pay but doesn't notice the crumpled body in the back of the truck or the hatchets heaped beside it. Even there, you looking for a sermon or just a chat? Don't really matter, frankly. First thing I ever learned behind the pulpit is that every homily is just a conversation. Ain't as one-sided as you might think, either. Preachers ain't shepherds. They're cowboys. They gotta run with the flock, keep them directed without fencing them in. So how about you take a seat and guide us somewhere? Anyway, why don't you tell me a scary story? You must have heard some good ones. You could rattle a congregation's bones, I bet. Death? Well, Ma died a few years after I was born. Pops used to tell me she was beautiful and that I had her eyes and her sense of conscience, but he always said it like it was an insult. Hey, you have any spooky campfire tales? Feels appropriate out here, right?
going now? Well, there must be something important, but I liked our talk. And there's more I'd tell you about the preacher's life if we had longer to chat. Heading up this way next, always moving, same as when I was a kid. If our paths cross, look for me, okay? <laughs>